Hello, everybody. Welcome to the InsureTech panel. Great pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, very excited about this topic. I think we got a phenomenal guest of speakers. Uh, we're going to start with InsureTech and then we're going to go over to the, the I Protect afterwards, so, so cybersecurity. Just give me a moment here. I'm going to load my screen. So hopefully you guys all can see that well at this point. And I'm going to dive into it for the sake of time here because we're going to fly right into this. Keep in mind, you can feel free to ask questions at any point and we'll hope to get that through it. But, but first, I want to cover some grounds here and what we see here. So just real quick about us. We are Holt. If you don't know us, we're one of Canada's most active uh, fintech investors, uh, seed stage, early stage investors. We've invested about 27 companies to date and we're going to do about roughly eight or so per year. We were based on the legacy of Sir Herbert Holt, so backed by the Holden family. And we've really built this market network of 500 advisors. We represent either 50 financial institutions or 110 independent angels or institutional investors. And we really believe it's really about optimizing for those deals. And as such, we've even seen one corporate partner as I've received up to four deals through this process. So these are like six figure customer deals. So very excited about that. And the fact that for every $1 we've put in, we've seen that it, they, those companies have gone on to raise $10. So we're now looking, of course, for the best insure techs uh, and cybersecurity companies around the world that play in the financial service landscape. But we're here to talk about insure tech today. So let's get into it. We are seeing that there's an increase in the amount of opportunities in the space. The venture market is booming right now. And we've seen that it's hit a new record. We're talking about 7.1 billion deals through, across, through 377 deals. We're also seeing that match with global IT spending, which is now uh, for insurance with it, that has reached $218 billion and continuing to expect it to grow between five to 8% from now until 2014. Now, things to consider that I find very interesting here is like the landscape of the, the COVID world and the impacts ultimately on the consumer. So there's a big shift and it's important to understand how that's looking. So there's been some polls to show that on a global scale, roughly, as you can tell by the diagram here, a lot of people are affected to a degree or somewhat to a degree, uh, anywhere from roughly 40 to 20% uh, of them. And then their ability to how it affected that they needed to skip bills or they had to postpone a mortgage, you have the, had to take a mortgage holiday or, or postpone a premium holiday in this situation. And Canada actually in this situation is faring worse with a lot of surveys showing that of the same survey, it was 10% worse. Or one survey revealed that 72% of Canadian life insurance consumers are concerned about their financial well being. So I want to dive into some trends that we're seeing here, and we're going to cover a lot of this in the panel, but top eight is like, we're seeing that UBI, like, so usage-based insurance and IOT is on the surge right now. And we're saying that the insurance or carriers are claiming that they can save as much as 30% by doing it this way. So fantastic. And the consumers are wanting this. They're saying 78% of in, are interested in commercial vehicle insurance, if it especially ones that, that ones that are based on miles driven. 67% of consumers said they would install smart sensors in their home to share real-time data in exchange for a discount. Or we're talking uh, Aetna, for example, integrates Apple Watch into its wellness program to collect behavior uh, to better ultimately improve the user quality of life in this story or, or provide discounts accordingly. Now, the next piece, embedded insurance is going to be a super hot topic, you know, finding the exact moment of point of sale. I'll jump over this big examples, right, from big car companies, anywhere from Tesla offering at the point of purchase, but Zipcar, BMW, Volvo. This is just one example of many areas to get into, and I think our panel is going to cover a lot of this stuff. Digitizing everything, you know, the whole process starts with proper robotic uh, process automation, but then it gets into more complex algorithms in that process. And that's what we're starting to see now is that complexity. Claims processing, you know, we can reduce manual work by almost 80% policy management operations, you know, the ability to extract inbound uh, exchanges from emails, voice transcripts, faxes, or other sources, regulatory compliance, right? Including how to automate the name scraping, compliance checking, client research, all that stuff. And yes, also underwriting the full process there, anywhere from data collection to loss assessment and pre-population. So lots of stuff happening there. New products being spun up at the time, right? Cyber insurance, 81% of people want cyber insurance, whether for the business or the consumer. 55% of small businesses are also interested in insurance to uh, adjust with the new business realities, maybe it's about online delivery, how do they can capitalize on the situation or, or support them in, in, in this new environment or insurance around uh, policy that cover loss of high in like income or, or postponing mortgage costs or any financial duress at this point from the consumers. Open innovation, I'm huge on this, if anyone who knows me. So finding better ways of, of APIs and connectivity to be able to build better product roadmaps is crucial to this. We've seen things on the fringes and we have great examples like Talum Health who, who we've invested in who's, you know, they're through their system, take a photo of your car accident as the consumer and it gets shared with the medical, it gets shared with the insurance and better collaboration between all parties in, in this, this whole claims process. 
but you also have things at its core. And we're going to hear from a great company in Centro and how they're changing the way that most systems built on Cobalt, they could build more module system, modular systems to support in the de delivery of group insurance, ultimately better serving uh, the, the customer. We've also seen on the other side though, big insurance carriers building out their own systems that end up spinning off. So for instance, Insure State Farm created High Road to cater to the needs of drivers. So a lot of cool stuff around open innovation. Big tech is moving in, Amazon licensed to sell third-party insurance in India. 10 cents, uh, we sure insurance platform just two years after launch has 25 million users. And Google and health tech firms have been doing lots, Oscar Health, Clover Health, Collective Health. Uh, lastly, I'd say that, uh, oh, sorry, two more things as we're, as we're getting through here. Tech adoption here. We're seeing cloud is, is key in, in being able to get onto the cloud to better service and build. Like that's part of the open innovation we talked about integration. And we'll consider to be some more as we go forward. And then I IoT and how it plugs into these systems as well uh, for all the sensors that we're tracking. But something that's super interesting, uh, there was a survey done uh, that showed that six out of 623 insurance executives surveyed, 85% thinks that virtual, augmented, and extended reality solutions for engaging with employees and customers will be very important going forward. And there's still stuff around, let's say, blockchain. More pilots being moved forward, what we're seeing with, with respect to supporting the actual smart contracts, facilitating those engagements, and then uh, helping the claims process where the insurance carrier can sit a little bit of arm's length and kind of put it to, because it's not a, it's a tricky situation when during that side, but uh, enable that the rules-based system through the blockchain to work but also future development around easing reinsurance record keeping into the future, as well as better encryption methods around of protecting better data, right? Whether it's medical data or insurance and sensitive information. So still early days for the blockchain side of things, but still very exciting and interesting. Uh, lastly, cyber insurance, you would think would be a bigger place right now. There's a lot of demand for it, yet it's only 8 billion in premiums that we spend. A lot of companies spend a, a boat ton in sort of cybersecurity protection. So I think there's a huge opportunity on the insurance side. Instead, we're also seeing around cybersecurity uh, in the insurance space is companies in the, uh, partnering with existing companies. Like we've seen one of our portfolio companies, OWL, with the prevention of insurance fraud by partnering with big corporates to uh, support their systems here. So without further ado, I don't think you're here to, if we're here to hear me talk, so let's dive into it. Lena is going to be joining us today. Lena Ismail, close to 20 years of, of previous experience in financial services from marketing, biz dev, product development, now took the plunge and runs her own business, CEO, co-founder of Catherine Real, proud driver as an advisor. John Harvey, close to 20 years of insurance experience, including sales and distribution for RBC, VP sales at Carstar before turning into an entrepreneur himself. Uh, newly, a bunch of different uh, consulting and product companies and InsureTech Canada, also proud as a hot tabby as an advisor. John McCann, over a decade of experience, insurance roles include product, marketing, digital strategy, and now ventured into your own ende endeavor with the CEO of Apollo. Uh, also, fun fact, you serve, you work as a travel journalist, so a very good skill, conducive for panel sessions, so fortunate for our audience to hear. So very exciting for this panel. Let's dive in. I'm going to stop share to make sure that it's big. I'm going to flip it to Lena maybe for the first question to get into it. Lena, we spoke before, for the audience to know, we had a little prep session, we said, and we were like, it's all about the customer, right? And so let's yeah. talk about that. Let's elaborate on areas like personalization, digital processes, and even maybe gamification as we saw that as there is some importance there. So can you elaborate on some of these areas? Yeah, absolutely. So when you think about, you know, the whole customer journey, you know, how do companies better serve their customers? I think foundationally, that has been something that has been talked about for some time. So the idea that if I'm along a particular path in my decision making process of looking at buying a car to me buying a home to outfitting my home with the technology that I need to be able to make it more automated, more protected, those are the times where likely I'm going to think about potentially purchasing a product like insurance and any type of insurance for that matter. So I could be in the process of going out and trying to get, you know, a mortgage and I think about life insurance. Um, I want to go out and actually, you know, do a, a bit of a search on particular lending products. You know, could you then present me with something that would be conducive to my needs at that time? So it's really trying to understand that customer journey. We can do that so much more readily today with all the data that's available, but of course, making sure that we're responding as a lot of companies are right now with products at points in time when the customer really wants to make that decision and when it feels natural to, to them to make that decision. Um, I think it's an interesting one because I'm working with a company right now as an advisor uh, called Walnut 
also obviously advising center who we'll be hearing from later, uh, but they're really focused on the whole acquisition side of things. And so when you think about their strategy right now to go to market is really embedding it within a lot of the fintechs and fintechs, e it's easier to do right now. Uh, from a regulatory standpoint, of course, we've always understood um, in Canada specifically the, the separation between you know banking and insurance. I think right now we're looking at more creative ways to handle this while still creating safeguards for consumers. And so I'm going to touch on really quickly gamification. And I think really that's probably a word that's used in different contexts and has different meanings within those, those different contexts. What I think really ultimately gets it gets to is engagement. How are you engaging with your customers? Are you doing it in a way that's providing value? Are you making it fun? Are you making it convenient and easy? And I think the entire paradigm of like insurance and the products that have existed today are very complex. Um, they are nuanced. It isn't easy to understand. It isn't easy, easy to be able to engage with customers. I think the saying goes, you know, insurance isn't, you know, bought, it's sold. And so I think now you're seeing a lot of companies that are at the forefront that are trying to make this much more engaging, much more intuitive. And they're also trying to make it fun um, at, at certain points in time where they're also adding on other benefits and products around that, like whether it's Headspace, you know, um, Dashlane, other services that wraps around the offerings that they're providing so that they can also be holistic in that, in that uh, manner. And then I think you touched on it, Jan, like when we talked about health, in the entire health tech space, that convergence between insure tech and health tech, and just you know using our Apple watches and other devices to make it fun to actually get in shape, to be healthy, um, and the same thing is also being seen within the automotive industry and and making sure that you know when you look at a Tesla as being a leader, they are engaging the consumer in a way where they're also rewarding and creating rewards when you know there's better driver uh, habits and behaviors. Um, they're trying to obviously automate a lot of that, so it's making it much more conducive for the driver to to uh, to do that. That and then be rewarded by it through discounts in terms of product offerings that they're going to get through their insurers. Awesome. Thank, like, there's lo lots to unpack there. Lots of good stuff. You covered the full gambit from it. So really seeing that, that la landscape evolving. It's an exciting time then in the insurance space for the consumer ultimately. So big shift there. Maybe John, let's flip it over to, to you. I know we talked more about like before uh, the idea of like empowering the broker in this story to better serve the customer and maybe a little bit of on the side of embedded finance and how it all fits into this. Can, can you kind of speak through what we're, we're, we're seeing? Like we, we touched on some of that, Lena covered some of those points, but do you want to elaborate from your, your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, from, um, from a technology standpoint, um, I, I, I think of a recent interview with Elon Musk where he actually referred to human beings as cyborgs because we're so dependent on our technology um, you know, losing your phone is now like the equivalent of, uh, of missing a limb. Um, and so you, when, when you look at the, the customer, uh, the end user or the purchaser of insurance, nothing's closer to them than their technology fit from a physical standpoint. I think this presents an opportunity for brokers and advisors actually uh, to be very bullish and to embrace uh, this technology to have more meaningful conversations with their clients. Um, and I, I think, you know, we're, we're at a, a, a fork in the road, so to speak, where, uh, you know, brokers are struggling and advisors are struggling to remain relevant to the customer. Um, and I, I think the, the technology solutions, two that come to mind, Fineo, uh, you know, one Canadian startup, uh, giving, you know, advisors tools uh, to have meaningful conversations at, you know, every stage of the client journey. And uh, another company that comes to mind is Trufla. Um, again, empowering brokers and advisors with technology solutions. So it's not about, you know, fighting against or resisting uh, the, the evolution of the technology. That would just be futile. It's how can uh, brokers uh, embrace the technology to have more meaningful conversations with clients? And, you know, when we talk about embedded insurance, for me, Embedded insurance, uh, when, when we look at what's happening, the trends in the industry is really at the point of acquisition or the point of sale. That's just the start of the journey. It, it, it's, you know, the, the one piece where I need something, I'm on Shopify, I'm on Amazon, and you have tech companies like Google and Amazon uh, and even Tesla getting into the embedded insurance space. And sure, that's fine. You made it easy for me to acquire at the point of sale, but my insurance needs have just begun at that stage. Again, going back to, you know, how can we use technology to have more meaningful conversations with the client? And then, you know, that technology can provide us with opportunities uh, to use data, to have data-informed decisions. 
uh, to, to move away from having a peanut butter approach to conversations with clients, uh, even when we look at the renewal cycle. Um, embracing those technologies will empower advisors uh, to segment uh, their clients and to be able to target those conversations based on data that's coming in. Um, as a small business owner, um, I might want embedded insurance at some point, but uh, I also have a high need to speak to an advisor and to interact with uh, a human being at some point, uh, depending on the stage of the milestone that I'm at as a consumer. But I expect that advisor to come to the table informed. And I think that's where technology is empowering, not just advisors, but, but consumers. Uh, that's a great point. Actually, it's, uh, it'll shift it over to, to Jeff in this story, uh, just to follow up on those points. You, know, you have an interesting thesis around embedded finance, also empowering, you know, thinking of the broker experience in this story, uh, which, you know, for you is advantageous for you as a company, but also advantageous for, for everyone in this situation. So do you want to kind of maybe speak, uh, you know, expand a little bit on that? Without a doubt. And, and to, to the points made before, I think we want to start with delighting the customer. And if we can start with that as our primary objective and work backwards, and I think it's it's easy sometimes to focus on, you know, our business or focus on a, a particular problem that isn't as actually close to the customer as the original thing. So if we start with delighting the customer as our primary objective, then we have to say, and, and where embedded really becomes interesting is let's go to where the customer is instead of pulling them into one of our funnels. Obviously, customer acquisition is a challenge for you know, any insure tech or any business. So we say, well, do we want them to have to go through a pay-per-click funnel and a landing page and sort of what, what marketing is today? Or can we try and find ways to go to them and go to existing buyer journeys? If they're buying that car or that house, they're a small business and they're signing up for another platform, they're a renter moving into, a, you know, into an apartment, then we can go to where they are. And so that's a first point of, you know, that where embedded starts to make a lot of sense. The second area for me is really data collection. Data collection is probably the biggest friction point. You know, Apollo is an online insurance provider. We focus on small businesses and individuals in the PNC space. So for us, how do we take the 25 or 30 questions that we need answered and reduce that by partnering with other companies who might already have that? If you're moving into a building and we already know your address and the building age and all that, we don't have to ask those questions. So again, it helps to delight that customer by embedding it, not just by working with their existing workflow, but also because now we don't have to ask all those questions about them because we can look at ways to collect that data. And I think, you know, to gamification, some people are trying to make it, you know, more you know, exciting and more interesting. I don't think someone's going to go to bed and say, you know, today's the day we're getting our insurance and they're, they're as excited as they are to line up for the iPhone. For me, it's like, how do we make insurance almost disappear? Focus on the advice and counsel so they know that they are covered. They know that their risk mitigation is there, the risk transfer, but let's just like not try and drag them away and make it a big purchase. Let's just get out of our own way, help them make sure they have the right coverage. And instead of making it more engaging, almost make it disappear, right? When you buy your Tesla, your insurance comes with it. When you rent your apartment, it comes with it. When you're a small business, you sign up for an app, it comes with it. And I think we can support brokers that way because then they're not doing paperwork. They're not collecting all that data. Instead, they're focusing on advice and counsel. These are great, great points. I really like the idea of like, how do we, how do we give more value to the insurance segment in this whole, whole side or value to the customer? Just some examples like, the same data that you use, we've seen it before, that to underwrite the, 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 the potential customer, if it's a business, you can actually provide back and share within the insights and say, hey, these are all the risks areas that you might, might, might want to consider for your own business. That's a value add. Now it's like, I want to go to you and get prices accordingly because you're helping with my own business. Or alternatively, as we know, like the value of the data itself, who's great at pricing this value of data right now? Insurance. Insurance cares care have a fantastic idea how to do it. And this is like this new wave and this movement happening here. So there can be a big movement, a big role to play the insurance in this. It can be a shift from, I think we talked about the idea of grudge purchases into others. Um, now on that though, like let's talk about the idea of adoption, acceleration of innovation, the culture of creation, like here, in, whether it's in Canada or internationally, what are some, like there are big, big pain points, right? There, there, how do we avoid bank the insurance sector might've been a little later to the party than the banking side and the banking was already late. How do we avoid uh, some like the learnings like the innovation theater? Uh, how do we get, you know, focus on those? Like, what are some of the key issues that are, that are blocking it? And how, how can we better foster a better innovative ecosystem? 
I, I, I'll jump in there just as uh, I know, you know, that's an area that you're passionate about, Jen, and, and so am I. Um, you know, when I think about working within the financial services industry for most of my career, I think what was always tough was trying to convince um, large uh, enterprises and incumbents, if we want to call them that, to tinker, if, if I can use that term, with new ways of doing things. Um, and tinkering, you know, can happen incrementally without a lot of capital investment, without like a big overhaul of your operations. But I think if you're constantly doing that and you're really doing it with a sense of purpose and focus on the types of outcomes that you're trying to drive, then I think that there's going to be a lot of value that can be derived from that and in turn, a lot of value that you can then, you know, give to your customers. And so I, I would say I would start with that sort of mindset. It really does start with that. And then you could branch into ways of partnering with, you know, new entrants into the industry um, through pilots and POCs and types of programs that I think would be amenable to the construct and the operations of some of these organizations. But what it'll do is it'll give us better perspective on how customers are receiving, you know, these types of services and products, because what they have is they have scale, but they also have, you know, um, captive audience of, of, of customers. And so I think there's got to be an openness to try to integrate and partner with some of these companies uh, more actively um, and try to test these theories out and to validate them, uh, but also to try to get that out there as soon as you can so you can get the data points that you need to assess what customers really want. Um, it's easy for us to say that they should be paying attention to the data. I mean, they have a ton of it. And so, you know, the industry could be learning a lot, uh, but the reality is I think there's a lot of legacy um, solutions in place that prevent them from doing it and, and probably a lot of operational challenges as well. Not to say they can't over overcome them. I think they really have to be deliberate about freeing that data and using it and analyzing in ways that they can derive a lot more meaning and then deliver the types of products that they need to. And I think you also talked about it earlier, that whole interoperability, that's really key to making sure that they can connect in with other programs and solutions and offerings that aren't always technology-based either. Um, and so when I mentioned Walnut, I mean, it's not really about the tech, it's the program itself and being creative about how you bundle the product offerings. Um, so I think those are some of the thoughts that I would share in terms of how the industry can try to move forward. Maybe to flip it, uh, I'll throw it to, uh, just because I want to get everyone equal uh, time on this, but to Jeff, because uh, we had spoken before as well as this idea around uh, how do you innovation culture, right? And how does remote work fit into it? And and then, you know, not putting too much emphasis on the buzzwords, which uh, you have interesting stance on different types of technology. So happy to share and hear it. But do you want to kind of speak a little bit uh, about that? Without a doubt, I think as much as we have to innovate in the technology and use technology to solve problems, we have to innovate in our culture. And I think that, you know, at least in the insurance industry, there's so many problems to solve. There's problems to solve in claims. There's problems to solve in straight through processing and customer acquisition and in data mining and AI and underwriting. Like there's so many different startups and companies solving those problems in different ways. Um, it's got to be difficult for a large corporation to be able to, to find ways to partner and pilot. But part of that is also the challenge that there isn't really a culture of failure, a culture of iteration. It's very much we're going to put ourselves on a, a five or 10 year digital transformation. We're going to hire uh, you know, a, a consulting company to solve those problems at scale. And then there isn't really a culture of, well, we're going to try something for a year. We're going to set some parameters. If it doesn't work, we're going to try something for a month. And so that culture, I think, that comes with that is, is equally as important. And especially now in a remote culture, you have, I think, incumbents who are going to be really challenged to recruit and retain top talent. I think startups and, and the new entrants are going to win in the culture battle because they're going to be solving problems. They're going to begin to scale. But it's also going to be a lot more fun and, and a lot more engaging to be able to have that innovation culture that we really pride ourselves on. And I think it's hard for the incumbents to compete then for talent and for culture which is going to be it nothing to do with blockchain or, or IoT or telematics. It has everything to do with, can they bring in top talent to the organizations and, and then retain and engage that talent? Great points. And, the, and it, it is interesting to see where a lot of the talent is shifting. And so if a lot of talent are building on new systems, but essentially some of the best developers we're seeing moving on blockchain, is it worth paying more attention to it? But yes or no, I, to be seen as it's still getting shaked out, but plus there's potential new use cases with it. Uh, but we, hey, we could have another side conversation on that. I mean, I'm joking, I'm laughing because uh, uh, Jeff and I had a quick brief conversation about the, the perception on what is the best systems to use here. But going forward here, there is a question uh, that was opened uh, and I'll read it and I'll give uh, John the, uh, the chance to respond just for uh, sake of, I guess, sharing the, the microphone to all. 
Uh, but this is from Uriel. Actually, uh, he worked a lot in the, from Israel and, and actually started his own uh, fintech venture after supporting a lot of fintechs before. So what are the main uh, constraints insurance companies have to get to data? So maybe think either from a North American perspective or, or Canadian specifically, depending on the jurisdiction. And how long does it take to get approval of compliance to get access uh, to the data? So more around just uh, the data requirements, the data protection, and the data regulations, data compliance. John, do you want to like um, uh, take a stab at that first one? Yeah. So if if I understand the question correctly, it's it's challenges challenges around access, uh, um, uh, accessibility and data. Um, I think th there's there's a number of things that. Um, the industry tends to um, use as almost fallback excuses, the like regulatory, like uh, 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 data security, um, et cetera. But I think, you know, access to data is, is not necessarily the, um, the issue here. I think it's um, it, back to almost what Jeff had, was talking about earlier was that, you know, do you have a culture that is data centric? Um, and I think, you know, that piece really has to lead uh, before you can even start, you know, there's, there's an old phrase that we use called uh, non-technology optimization. So, you know, uh, having a culture in place of continuous improvement and looking at solutions before you automate uh, is essential for technology to be an enabler. So, you know, using that as a, as a parallel, um, you know, with data, I don't think the, you know, the, the restrictions um, around data are, are uh, significant enough uh, to, to prevent uh, companies from, from moving forward. Is, do we have a data-centric culture that knows how to ingest the data? I think that's you know, a key piece that, that we hear. You know, I'll use tech, uh, telematics as a use case uh, example or autonomous uh, driving. Uh, when you know, we talk to carriers, uh, a lot of the feedback we get is um, we have no shortage of access to data. We don't know what to do with the data. We don't know how to ingest the data. So I think this you know, is going to force the issue around, is that a core competency or core capability that uh, carriers can build internally? Or is it something where they're going to have to shift towards more of a reliance on partnerships um, and partnering with companies that have that, those core capabilities? Awesome. Well said. I'm going to launch a poll for fun now. Uh, I think everyone should be able to vote. So please do. And then I'll share the results to see what do you think is the biggest non-tech trend for 2021. So let's see what uh, the audience says. And maybe it helps feed some discussions if we miss any key points. I'd like to point out Robin uh, Monier, uh, who just uh, chimed in. I, I really like the comment. Is it really about making uh, the, the, the customer forget about the insurance? Or is it just that there's a friction point in it? And I think there's a lot of truth in that in a sense. Like, Insurance does well as capturing your risk and maybe as the user you should better understand what your risks are and they're pricing it accordingly. So maybe we need more knowledge, but like anything in financial services, you're probably up against apathy, right? More often than not, don't care, just want it, just want to fix, just want to resolve. But very great points uh, around, around that piece. I'm going to, uh, as I'm ending this poll, please vote. Uh, panelists can also vote. I'm going to bring Hans onto the stage who, hello Hans, all the way from New Zealand. I uh, hope you're doing well. Doing great. Thanks, Jen, and uh, great to be here. Awesome. All right. Just before I do, I'm going to end poll. I'm going to share results. And boom, there it is. The very official ones. I don't know if the YouTube world can see it, so I'll read off. There's some split stuff, embedded in sure tech and, and new product development and omni channels and big tech. I just see a full spectrum. Everyone's all over the place. That, what do I see? There's a lot of exciting things happening here. So no, no, no clear, decisive one, uh, one winner here. But why we, well, maybe we can all be winners and listen to the central pitch. He's a winner from New Zealand. So let's hear it. Do you want to share screen at this point? And then we'll hear, we'll hear from you and then they, they will get our panelists to kind of weigh in and give some comments and questions about what you're up to. That's great. Thanks very much, Jen. And uh, I am Hans Fraunlob. I'm from uh, Centro. And uh, Centro, and we're transforming the way that group insurance is bought, sold, and serviced worldwide. And if you're not familiar with the insurance sector, group insurance is the kind of insurance typically that companies buy for all of their people, things like life insurance and health insurance. Group insurers have got a real challenge today. Uh, they honestly can't really meet the modern expectations of today's business customer. And that's for a few reasons. They've got a lot of legacy technology and that makes it really difficult to maintain and it's expensive for them to maintain 
but it also means that their back office support teams actually have to invent workarounds to service the business customer and their selling partners. That's inefficient and it's pretty error prone and their selling partners get frustrated. And all of that net together, if you're a business owner buying insurance cover for your people, you're expecting choice, uh, you're expecting omni-channel service, and uh, the honest truth is many insurers today just cannot provide that kind of experience. So we've introduced Centro to solve that problem for insurers. So Centro is a group insurance policy administration and employee benefits platform. And the approach that we take is we provide the insurer tools for everybody along their service and delivery chain. That's brokers, that's third-party service providers, and it's the employers as well because the employers are involved in this transaction. But it allows them all to work together to provide a really seamless experience for the insured person, the employees. Centro is cloud-native SaaS. It's highly configurable and it enables a full end-to-end -end service experience. Importantly, we can also support the inclusion of non-insurance benefits alongside group insurance benefits. We offer our customers low cost of change, and so we're really ideal for that mid-market, regional and growing insurer. Along our journey, we've learned a few things. Um, most of our competition is actually focused on the multinational name brand insurers that you would all recognize day to day. Very few platform providers are also thinking about the right-hand side of this slide, which is the employee benefits and the employee services part of the equation. And so we've identified a real gap in the market. Um, our competitors typically uh, don't address the mid-market segment particularly well, and very few actually think about the employee benefit and employee experience part. So our central platform we see as having a real uh, gap in the market and us filling that gap that we think is so important, not just for the insurers, but really for us what motivates us is improving the life of working people. And for us, that means making it easier for their boss to arrange things that can help them day to day. So here's some recent wins that we've had and some recent successes, and we're really excited about uh, uh, this segment. Um, we're happy to announce that we've uh, just signed an agreement with our first European UK customer, and also our first US customer. And earlier on the panelists were talking about cyber insurance. And what I can share with you now, although I can't share the name of the customer yet, is that uh, group cyber insurance is part of both of these propositions. We've also agreed new partnerships in New Zealand uh, with leading insurers like Tower Insurance and NIB Health. And in Canada, we're building our team there and we will have customer announcements and partner announcements coming very, very soon. So I'm Hans Fraunhoff, I'm the uh, co-founder of Centro and uh, it's terrific to be involved in this segment. Uh, we're so excited about it and we can see the change coming that Jan and the other panelists have talked to and we're thrilled to be part of it. Awesome, well done. Uh, for sake of time, because I want to make sure we're, we're, we're tight, can each panelist go through and maybe say a comment and a question, and then we'll bring it back to Hans for final remarks. So Lena, John, Jeff, who'd, who'd like to kick it off? I can take it first. I appreciate it, Hans. Great, great presentation. I think it's tons of innovation to be had in that space. Do you think there's an opportunity to redefine group in the way that you're approaching the market, the way that your technology works beyond just employers? What's your take there? Absolutely. Um, I think that group is anything that somebody organizes and somebody else gets. So for us, that can be an employer, it can be an affinity group, it can be any collective that concentrates around a single unifying point. So yes, absolutely. We believe that group can span more broadly than the employer-employer relationship. It's really around a collective of people unifying towards a single uh, point. Lena or John? Yeah, I'll jump in there. I mean, I'm very close to um, Hans and Rob and the team at Centro. So I love what you guys are doing and, and supportive of it. Um, I, I know, you know, the platform um, probably in more detail than others do um, sitting here, but what often I think about Hans and if we took it away from just the tech and just looked at the actual convergence of some of these themes, do you find that there is going to be a convergence between, you know, the way group insurance is being handled to kind of individual insurance 
Um, and if that is going to take shape, um, do you see your solution as being something that can still enable insurance companies and carriers in particular to be able to deliver much more meaningful digital you know, channels for their customers uh, through both paths? Yeah, no, thanks, Lena. And absolutely we do. Um, if you think about yourself as a worker in a workplace, um, your boss is providing you some, with some stuff. And then as an individual, you've got stuff going on in your own life. And we think that that convergence of what happens at work and what happens in your own life um, is actually underserved. And so by that, I mean the, the employer and the uh, services that the insurance company and other service providers uh, bring to the table. Um, quite often, it's only through the work lens. And uh, what we want to enable is enabling it through the employee lens and having the employee being able to um, blend their own personal experiences with what the workplace is providing and making it easier for everybody to provide the right mix of things that the individual wants via the workplace. So yes, absolutely, we see our platform as uh, really being an enabler for insurers to deliver that kind of uh, choice and service experience. Great, thank you. John, 30 seconds and a 30 second answer if possible. Absolutely, Hans, I think you may have answered it uh, at the end of your, your last response there, but what would you say Centro does differently from everybody else in this space? No, thanks, John. I think what we do differently is, is we think about the employee as the customer, even though we sell to insurance companies. So our paradigm is oriented around what would I want if I was an employee from my employer and from the people that my employer is arranging to have services put in front of me? Why would I care? So I think that's the way we think about it differently. We start with the employee as our, as our uh, thought and, uh, and go backwards from there. Awesome. Well done. Uh, thanks, Hans. I'll let you uh, gracefully say goodbye as you do take off. Just for our panelists, I'm going to do some quick rapid speed questions to, to close up this session. Real quick to each of you, just one word to keep it uh, in sync. Which company are you most excited about for InsureTech? Uh, you're on mute, John. Uh, any, anyone want to go first? I, I'm just going to say Walnut. I'm going to say, I'm going to say Trufla. Um, yeah. Is it bad to say Apollo? <laughs> say what you want. Great. Personal branding. Love it. Uh, which trend is most exciting for the 2021 from, from your perspective? I, uh, I think niche products. So I think just realistically for 2021, that's, uh, you know, gig economy workers, et cetera. There's niche products for everyone. So I think that's the most exciting thing. Perfect. I think moving away from uh, the, the term usage-based insurance, we need to talk about user-based insurance. Awesome. And Jeff? I think small business is going to be a, a massive renaissance of entrepreneurship coming out of, of pandemic and lockdown. I think the small business insurance space is going to be a great market to be in, to watch. Awesome. Love the small business. Last question, 2021. Is it the year for blockchain? Yes or no? Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's the year, but it's a good starting point for us seeing more use cases and applications of it. If you asked me that question a week ago, I'd have a different answer. So um, I agree with Jeff on this one. <laughs> All right, perfect. We, I feel like a follow-up question, but we are out of time. Thank you to, that concludes the insure tech side of this presentation. So I'll ask you all, thank you very much for the time as I shift forward. I'm actually going to share screen now as I move towards the next piece. Uh, hopefully everyone can now see the next. I'll ask our panelists, you're free to turn off your cameras or if you want to join with the other panel, um, feel free to keep asking questions or, or whatnot with the Q&A that's on there. Uh, I'm going to dive right into this. Okay, so let's reframe here. We're in the cybersecurity world. What are we seeing right now? We're seeing that the, the 6 trillion in cost by 2021 projected to hit 10.5 trillion. This is up from 3 trillion in 2015. So guard, and on the other side, it's like, well, how are we protecting 170 billion in the global security market with executives expecting a 70% potential budget shrink at this point? Uh, on the other side, well, how are we gonna prevent and, and protect against this? We're seeing a surge in the amount of funding rounds, 30 mega rounds, like over hundred million bucks. It's during 2020. So obviously during the pandemic, it's growing through this time. And we're seeing uh, close to 11, over $11 billion in deals that are occurring funding amounts. Now, if we look at the global market, like there is somewhat of a cons concern that we're seeing 
30.4 billion records that were compromised came from just five breaches. So there's a kind of a decrease in the amount of number of breaches, but a surge in the amount of total records. And actually what's uh, crazy about this whole story is that a big piece has to do with just uh, malconfigured uh, databases uh, in, in this situation. Uh, flying forward is saying, okay, so big side insider versus outsider threat. Anywhere from 60 to 75% of it has to do with an outside threat. Uh, and, and then ranging on the inside, more about actually just employee mistakes. And then from uh, data from Cybent saying that 95% of security uh, breaches caused by human error. Now, quick eight trends I want to fly through. And again, don't want to take too much time as we flow back to the panel, but COVID calls from work from home, just a, a need to actually shift to the better tools online, more collaborative tools to consider from like Zoom to Skype to Slack, but also understand the cybersecurity shortcuts that, you're use, that the employees are taking and a surge in phishing scams from anywhere from, hey, vaccines are occurring to you know, uh, economic relief. Ransomware is trending substantially higher, 435% increase since 2020. We're, uh, and we're seeing the demands getting more sophisticated. They're talking left towards of $40 million, but they're better pricing it, priced on based on you know, how much revenues, 0.1% to 9% of total revenues or understanding what your compliance costs are and, and charging accordingly. And a blend of this extortion, um, uh, sub, uh, extortion ransomware attacks. Cloud and I, I, uh, IoT is a big issue as well from the side that 90% of enterprises use some form of cloud service. However, that we're seeing that 67% uh, of security teams complain around a lack of visibility into their cloud infrastructure. And it's not just the, the cloud, it's the cloud service providers themselves that are also being attacked. With a surge in the amount of IoT devices that are expected to become on stream, 67% of these enterprises have, have, have experienced an IoT incident because they're, let's just face it, they're not the most secure uh, uh, devices. And this, these are only supposed to uh, increase substantially 30 billion of these devices by 2025 coupled or compounded by the fact that 5G architecture is still in its infancy and will require a lot of uh, research around finding the loopholes to help solve for these system issues. Compliance spending is a surgeon as well. Like just the, let's just look at GDPR as an example. 88% of companies spent more than a million dollars on GDPR preparation, yet 70% of companies agree that the systems they put in place for that will not scale as new GDPR regulations come, uh, uh, come through. So more costs expected on the uh, compliance side Mobile uh, is really maturing market segment now, unfortunately, in the sense that it's not just about the adware, which is the most common type, but other things from uh, remote access Trojans, banking Trojans, crypto miners, which we'll also get to as well in this panel, adware and even ransomware. And threats raising uh, from you know, encrypted messaging applications and, and targeting uh, the critical security vulnerabilities of, of Apple and Android. We're going to speak a little bit on this as we have some great panels around this. So blockchain and crypto mining and the, and the use of our existing systems for that, but not just using our own systems for crypto money, but also now facilitating larger DDoS botnet attacks for even increase more side profits. I'm talking about other areas from AI. So AI could be used as a, a tool to help support the security systems, right? From natural language processing, face detection, automatic threat detection, et cetera. It's also being used to develop smart uh, malware attacks to bypass the latest security protocol. So lots of concerns. And with a lot of us shifting online for our purchases, increase in mage cart becoming also an epidemic in some ways. Uh, and so injecting malicious JavaScript code into skimmers and all the e-commerce websites. Last thing I do want to leave the, uh, from here is the thought of, well, where is the idea of the talent in all this? Arguably, this uh, global unemployment rate is somewhere around 0%, as some would say, and, and, and expected to be that way from 2021. Average salaries are high at $140,000 annually on average, with more than two-thirds of cybersecurity professionals struggling to find their cybersecurity path, given probably the more nascent race, uh, side of the, the industry itself. And 70% of cybersecurity professionals claim in their organization is impacted by a shortage. So there's a lot of questions around uh, the, the talent gap. All right, enough from me. I wanna flip right into this right away and get to hear from our awesome panelists. Start with uh, Dave Unsworth, 25 years in financial services. Great to have him here, especially in venture investing, uh, starting at RBC Ventures and spending eventually into information venture partners, boasting some of Canada's uh, first unicorn exits, especially in cybersecurity. And we're actually proud to have them as a Holt uh, community partner. Eva Lau will be joining us as well. Uh, 25 years starting in corporate tech, uh, shifting into venture and research before launching eventually Wattpad, which is a great Canadian success story, 600 million that was acquired this year, now serves as founding partner of Two Small Fish and a huge support of the early stage tech 
Canadian ecosystem, including Holt Accelerator. Great to, as, a, as an advisor, great to have you here. And lastly, Jeremy Clark, well-known uh, Concordia Associate Professor, focusing on security, cryptography, blockchain, authentication, social engineering. Uh, he holds the NSERC RCGT and Cadillac Industrial Research Chair in Blockchain Technologies. I can personally attest, as I attended his blockchain course, that he's helped me unpack a little bit more of the foundational layer, but super helpful with his time in portfolio companies. Great to have you all here. I'll ask you uh, at this point to all flip on those cameras so that we can see you all at this point. We may have turned off your cameras midway, so you have to return them on, Dave, Eva, and Jeremy. The, uh, Dave, I think you've unmuted at this point. Just, there we go. Uh, someone has to let me turn it on. Yes, yeah, the host has stopped. That's right. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Got it. Apologies. It might have been me. No Thank worries. You. Technical difficulty. We got through it. Dave, let's dive into it. You're seeing a lot of interesting technology. Uh, but at the same time, there's still a majority of the breaches caused by misconfigured databases or services. So what are your thoughts around investing in the, the latest technologies versus just better systems and architecture review and patch management? Yeah, it, it's a, you know, it, it really is a, a big problem. And I think there's probably some shorter term sort of investment thesis that we have and, and then longer term. I think, I think in the short term, um, you know, particularly in the aftermath of solar winds, we've been taking a, a long look at um, API security companies as a as sort of a thesis area. It's, it's a segment or a sub-segment or a niche of the overall API sort of management market, which is huge, but there's been a huge also spend in sort of the API security specialists. And, you know, as information venture partners, as fintech sort of investors, we think that the, you know, the, the rise of open banking and, and all of the API connections into these organizations are just going to continue to, to, you know, make them vulnerable to attack. So, there's, there's been some interesting companies like like Salt, for example, and a few others, uh, Cloud Vector, that have, that have got a lot of attention in, in that space. Um, I think on you know from a longer term perspective, one of the one of the areas we're mostly concerned about is just the historical way that we continue to build an app for that. So we continue to replicate data over and over and over again, the same data in various data you know various application silos. And all that does is continue to increase the size of the cybersecurity attack vector. So, you know, it's it, this is going to be a much longer term change. We have to fundamentally change the way we are re-architecting applications. But we did an investment recently in a company called Simshi that's a data fabric provider, a data centricity sort of uh, player. And what they're really trying to do is leave data where it is and allow you to sort of aggregate or assemble the data that you need and, and create a business solution on top of that data. Um, without replicating that data over and over again, which is madness and, and also a huge security issue. So um, that, that's what we're seeing there. Awesome. Well, that's already some great, great, great insights there. Just to uh, touch on another point then on the data side and kind of relating to then the compliance side, how are you seeing the impact? Like the compliance side, we're seeing a lot of shifting right now, different the uh, shifting landscapes, privacy laws, open banking, GDPR, et cetera. And then relating to, you know, the getting prepared to handle this. So like the, maybe did, are, are the, cert, the security certifications that, that match with it? What are our views on kind of the, the compliance and then prepare, and of the evolving landscape for the enterprises? Sure. Uh, you know, um, it, we, we love this area. We're heavily invested in it. Um, you know, I, I think the, the, the elephant in the room is that most large enterprises actually you know, out of the gate are having a really hard time with GDPR and CCPA because they actually don't know where all their PII resides, never mind how they can secure it and how they can, you know, enable um, sort of the right to forget and other things that are required by the compliance. So we were early investors in a company called Big ID that specializes in PII discovery. So if you think about that, just even trying to help an organization understand where all the PII resides, what applications are accessing it in what form, um, as a baseline before you can even decide whether or not you're being compliant with GDPR and, and other things. So, and if you don't know where all the PII is, you also don't know how to secure it. So very topical. We've seen an explosion of vendors in that space. There's a bunch of entrenched incumbents that have sort of legacy software, if you think about the Veronis's and Informatica's and others. So it is, it is ripe for new technology, especially with applied AI and some of the machine learning techniques for finding some of this data. So, um, I think we're early innings, to be honest. I think a lot of enterprises are still grappling with the, where is it as, as opposed to, you know, the higher level functions and how to forget it and, and, you know, how to protect it. So 
Awesome. Yeah. Exciting area. Very, very much agreed. Uh, let's flip it. Uh, Jeremy, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, maybe we can focus more on blockchain, crypto mining right now. We, we spoke previously, you used the analogy, the wild, wild west a little bit, uh, which I think is a very interesting way of putting it. Uh, what are some of the various attacks that you're seeing, your perception around the security and the perception of the security strength of the underlying technology, like we're seeing, will there be forks, uh, things what's happening with Bitcoin right now, or, or other ones that you want to speak to? Sure, sure, sure. So if I were to pick a blockchain to talk about, it would probably be Ethereum. That seems to be where a lot of the action is. And specifically, it's around finance. So now uh, there's a lot of services that have emerged. Uh, they do something called decentralized finance or DeFi. And it's a growing market. Uh, it's still obviously going to be small, you know, relative to traditional finance, uh, which is an enormous market, but uh, it's still material amounts. Uh, so it's, it's a market that's approaching about $100 billion US. And uh, when there's that much money at stake, uh, you can imagine there's a lot of security vulnerabilities uh, that are being exploited and a lot of attacks. And we see multiple attacks every month. Uh, usually they're around uh, $10 million in that sort of range. Uh, so, so a couple of times a month, someone will find a way to drain a DeFi service of, of about $10 million or at least maybe lock it up so the users can't, they can't keep it. Um, the main challenge is that uh, in blockchain, uh, you have anonymity, or at least a, a sort of weak notion of anonymity, and payments are irreversible. So once they're, they're, they've gone through, you can't do anything about it. Uh, so it's a very, it's like the most hostile environment that you can try and run a financial service, I would say. Uh, but it's usually the small players uh, that, that are getting burned, and, and the big companies actually have had a lot of success uh, in, in, in maintaining you know, secure services. Awesome. Love that perspective uh, from your side. Can we go a little, uh, touch on that a little bit more? We spoke previously, the importance around auditing and, and how that is currently being approached and how the, why that's so core to what you're, what you're doing when you're, you're dealing with blockchain technology. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So we do a lot of auditing. I, I have students that do technical auditing uh, for companies like Consensus and Trail of Bits. And uh, as you mentioned, we have, I have a research chair with uh, Raymond Shabbat, Grant Thornton. Uh, and so that's looking at the financial auditing, uh, which also comes into play when companies have these crypto assets on their balance sheets. Uh, a company has to go in and they have to make sure, are these things real? Can they be stolen? Uh, you know, what are the internal controls around them? Uh, and so it's, it's a big learning curve, I think, for everyone, uh, both the programmers of the services, because, you know, block coding up a blockchain decentralized application or DAP, it's a little bit different uh, than programming for the cloud, which would be a similar environment. And a lot of the differences happen around security. And you can, you know, you get devs that are very, very good. They have a, a good track record in developing traditional apps, you know, for in cloud. Uh, but, but if their mental model isn't exactly right about blockchain, they can just get a small thing wrong. And then all of a sudden, you know, all the money is, is drained and it's catastrophic. Um, so auditing is important. Just audit, audit, audit. Uh, that's great. Thanks for our, uh, very interesting, especially as we're seeing like, a lot of the breaches still on old systems, still misconfigured databases, and it's just transcending to the next technologies that are out here and sounds even more complicated than that. Uh, Eva, why don't we shift uh, on your side? We had some good chats, uh, mentioned your perspective, you know, many founders and, and having the, maybe the right tool, but maybe a little bit oversight around uh, how to build a more uh, greater ecosystem. Do you, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I just want to be upfront right now. My dog just kind of like barking at the mailman. Um, if, if it's just going to go nuts, uh, just please forgive me. Um, so yeah, so for me, um, I build networks and uh, certainly build the largest uh, consumer network here, uh, you know, based in Canada and go a global network of over 90 million monthly users. So every time I talk to founders, they have great tech, great solutions for the customers. Um, they, they, they just rush to del uh, deliver their product to the potential customers. And then without thinking the necessary network effects is necessary in, 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 the, in the product. Let me just kind of give you some examples. Um, so if a, a, a legal tech company have some great AIs and they want to provide a solution for a legal firms to let's say scan their documents, let me tell you, I'm sure that there will be another five, six, maybe even 10, 15 companies doing exactly the same thing. So if we ignore the network effect that you can potentially build into the product, what that means is you will be putting your product in the commodity category, trying to compete with features and price. So you will always kind of, you know, put neck to neck with another, you know, competitors, like, do they have more features? 
are they selling cheaper than you? So in that in that uh, realm, you don't necessarily have a very you know strongly defensible uh, product because you know uh, if the customers say, oh, you know the the other product has you know more features, cheaper, they can switch easily. However, if you can build a product that actually pulls in more stakeholders into the ecosystem, all of a sudden you create a network effect in, in, in the usage of, of the product. If you look at all the other uh, successful companies um, that, that are massive here right now, Google, Facebook, you know, Airbnb, Uber, they all network effect based, even AI companies. AI companies, they may look like a B2B product, a B2B SaaS product that they don't necessarily interact with other companies, but the data set that goes underneath it, the data network goes underneath it, continue to help all the participants, all the businesses that are working off on this platform with intelligence and insights. That alone, it's so valuable and make the switching cost extremely expensive. That's super helpful. Maybe can we expand a little bit on that, on how you build these, these collaborative ecosystems from the tech side? Like you, you've got great, you know, we talked about before, it's an engineering problem and aligning incentive mechanisms for people to work. It's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not simple marketing, right? As, 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 as it is. So can you explain how that, how to do that a little bit better for, for the cybersecurity folks? Absolutely. So when you build a product, you need to think about the network of building that network effect is an engineering issue rather than let me just go do more marketing, get more people to come on board and use the product. Of course, that alone is, is, is important. You know, that's why there we are a lot of people working in the SEO uh, uh, MarTech space to make that more effective. However, when you are looking at the product, the usage of the product actually allows you to collect information and patterns of what people are actually doing. So let's say, you know, for uh, insurance tech, you know, people make claims. What information are they sharing with you? What information that the, the insurance uh, uh, um, broker has to go back and forth to get those information? Now, that is a kind of insight that, you know, any B, uh, 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 B2B product will be able to collect. Now, have the product designer thought of how do you increase that kind of usage so that they can have better insights and better prediction of, hey, the chances of actually close, uh, closing this lead, uh, you know, how does that look like compared to people who give me less information? So when we are looking at building the network, it's always about how do you create that kind of algorithm to encourage users to do things that you want them to do and create algorithms so that you minimize the bad behavior that you want them to have on your system. So it looks like Jen is a little bit frozen over there. Uh, am, I, am I the only one noticing this? Can you, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I think the video, it's not necessarily as smooth, but that's okay. All right, I'll keep going and hopefully nothing crashes. If not, I'll let you guys continue. I do have a question. Uh, there's questions from the audience. P please feel free to uh, ask them now at this time and then we'll look at them. I don't see any yet, but I do want to maybe shift on to the idea of quantum and the mm -hmm. associated risk. Canada is a bit of a leader from the research side of things, but I'm really concerned around the security protocols and how we're protecting against it, how adverse actors could leverage existing infrastructure, maybe stuff that's been built on the blockchain to then maybe take advantage of this. What are, what is everyone's, is quantum, I, you know, sometimes you speak to people, quantum's already here and sort of being used, depending on who you're talking to. What is, maybe what's the research saying or what is the investment landscape look, uh, look like uh, from, you know, Dave and Eva's side as well? Right. So I think, you know, from my perspective, quantum is absolutely real. And I just feel that, um, you know, if we look at the, um, the Moore's law, uh, a lot of our, our computing power, it's already being pushed to the edge. Uh, look at just the Bitcoin mining uh, farms in China. Um, I think, you know, I read a report that just that electricity consumption of all the uh, mining farms in China, uh, it's already, you know, surpassing the, the whole thing, uh, the whole need in, in, in countries such as Spain. So if we continue to see the adoption of cryptocurrency, uh, you will know, do, there, it's no doubt that the energy consumption uh, in all these farms and all these computing is going to just go astronomically higher. 
even for you know general things like uh, AGI, artificial general intelligence. I read another uh, a data scientist says she's tried to deploy a model, a, net, a neural net, uh, you know, to just run uh, you know one model. Um, that energy output, it's already it's that that energy re a carbon footprint is already like a transatlantic flight. So in order to continue to break through in a technology, computing power has to continue to increase. And what that means is, you know, quantum computing will probably will give us more hope. There are other things like photonic, you know, um, uh, microprocessor, you know, that's in the works right now. But in general, what we're talking about is computing power has to uh, improve. So in, in such a way, when quantum computing become more readily available, maybe to hackers, then all of a sudden, then all these kinds of security that we have right now will be very vulnerable. So we are seeing now a new breed of uh, companies, uh, at least in my, in, my, in my world, that are already trying to make encryption uh, quantum ready. Um, so they are trying to, you know, quantum encrypt uh, the um, the actual data, and they also try to uh, quantum encrypt the transportation layer as well. So that's what we are seeing, and I I'm actually very excited with these kind of innovation, and uh, certainly we'll keep tabs of what's happening because um, we have to be. What I'm trying to say is we have to be future proof. Awesome. Maybe uh, hearing what are we seeing, Jeremy, from the, the top research side or, or Dave as well from uh, in, any investment side? Maybe I'll let Jeremy uh, pile in on that one, because to be honest, we don't spend a lot of time focused on that, given the size of our fund and sort of the stage we focus at. There's uh, I think there's a lot of capital needed to go into some of these technologies. It's just not a sector that we, we, we play in. I, I share Eva's enthusiasm, though, in, in comments about the impact it's going to have on the industry and, and the vulnerabilities it's going to create as the cyber criminals get more and more horsepower. Yeah, yeah, and, and on the academic side, you know, things like machine learning, AI, and quantum computing are huge fields, uh, almost as big as blockchain. Actually, probably larger uh, than blockchain, and, and maybe deservedly so. Um, yeah, and and so the a lot of especially on quantum computing, it's. Um, uh, you see industry uh, pushing the envelope forward, uh, but a lot of the results are, are also coming from from academics and at least laying, it's a, it's a technology that really needs some foundational work laid uh, in order to work. Uh, it's not something that you can just roll out uh, right away as a commercial product. Uh, and so, yeah, these are, these are exciting areas, I'd say. Awesome, thanks for that. Uh, apologies, I, I can, I'm gonna get my video up in a bit, so you're just gonna hear a voice having the fun of a computer crash right now, but uh, we'll, we'll power through this. And besides, we're here to hear next, uh, let's bring up, I would say David uh, from Narrowist. I think it's a great opportunity for him to come on and present accordingly uh, what he's working on. And then we'll actually, I'll have our panelists after give a comment and a question to why you have, what, uh, what you guys saw there. So David, if you're available now, I'll get you to turn on your video. And if you have a screen to share, uh, go ahead and do so. And I'll let you kick it off with uh, your, your pitch. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'll jump into that uh, uh, right away. Um, so just, uh, there we go. Does that mean if you can see my screen? Good to go. Excellent. So hello, everybody. Uh, my name is David Pirval. I'm the uh, founder of Nauris. Um, I have been a chief of security of various multi-billion dollar companies uh, in Europe and in the UK as well, and an ethical hacker for about 20 years. So uh, today I'll be talking very quickly about today's cyber risks and disruptive opportunities, and also bringing in some information about our approach, which focuses very much on distributed cybersecurity in terms of detection, zero trust, and other areas. Um, we are already in a distributed world in terms of networks, but we're still following a lot of um, centralization uh, solution or centralized based solutions in what comes to cybersecurity with um, quite disastrous consequences. So we need a fundamental doctrine change on, on this one. So, um, you know, as complexity of today's networks uh, uh, grow, that really um, hampers defense. So, um, we have uh, heard, of course, in the last months about the uh, SolarWinds incident. This is just one of, of various, but it's probably one of the most expensive lately. Um, 100 billion probably in costs estimate just for cleanup and rebuild. Um, and this is, of course, not limited to you know loss of uh, IP, loss of data, um, loss of uh, 
uh, reputation, et cetera, which is uh, impossible to calculate, especially in long or medium term. Make no mistake, I mean, this is due to about 30 years of stagnation in uh, cybersecurity approaches. Uh, antiviruses and firewalls are still around and more and more ineffective as time goes. Um, it takes approximately 200 days on average to detect the cyber breach. This is a huge issue as well, and that goes directly hand in hand with the complexity of uh, today's systems. Um, on the old model of security, current model, quote, quote, the more devices on the network, the larger the attack surface, and that hasn't changed. All of these are, of course, single points of failure that uh, an attacker can use to leverage, uh, what can I say, his will against the whole network just by attacking a single machine. Um, so expanding the network makes it more vulnerable to hackers. And, uh, you know, guess what? That's what everyone did uh, by, uh, you know, increasing cloud systems usage, sometimes with very little visibility of what's going on. IoT, of course, which is impossible to ignore, you know, the rise of, uh, of IoT, uh, which basically has no standards around it and a bunch of uh, third-party applications as well. Uh, so every device, as I mentioned, is pretty much a single point of failure. So in the words of Mr. Sheldon Hagen, the former chairman of NATO's Intelligence Committee and uh, our ambassador, um, the centralized model where the hacking of a single device could compromise a network is categorically flawed. So we need to fundamentally change this, this principle. Um, so now this takes the biggest weakness in cybersecurity currently and turns it upside down. So it makes it into an ever expanding competitive advantage for the, for the client. So we, we do cybersecurity with blockchains um, and blockchains as in we use more than one for different use cases. Um, so it's a completely new architectural approach in terms of you know, how cybersecurity is thought about and delivered in complex enterprise systems or global systems that, you know, think about banks that have, for example, a bunch of branches across every country they are in and each branch has their own local network, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that becomes a problem in terms of cybersecurity and containment. Um, so all devices become the defense. We leverage the centralization in uh, networks uh, to create kind of like a network effect uh, to increase the security of, of your whole environment by every device that's added. Um, they all become nodes in a chain um, that uh, end up uh, allowing for collaborative ec ecosystems, not just in the client side with all maybe you know, imagine if it's a group of companies that's distributed around the world, each company actually become, ends up collaborating to a whole network of cybersecurity uh, consensus. Um, we allow for automatic uh, decentralized authentication of everything that's running on the system. So from processes to APIs um, and enforcement against the, you know, known threats um, by every machine in every network that we are part of. So uh, we have built a game-changing uh, innovation that makes the quantum leap in effectiveness in security management of uh, complex environments. And we have received quite a number of awards for this. Uh, we were the most disruptive Cyber Vendor 2020 nominated. Uh, we also were finalists of some of the best accelerators in the world in uh, three continents, including here in Holt, which is our favorite. Um, we have uh, uh, currently a number of clients that uh, um, are aligned with us from many business verticals, from banking to big industry um, to blockchain itself uh, in exchanges. So this approach uh, is the most exciting advance, we believe, in the cybersecurity field for years. While decentralization transforms the, the world of traditional finance, the world is due for, I'm very sure about that, the similar disruption in, in security across tech, especially IoT as well. Um, blockchain and banking. So we have had the growth of about a thousand percent since the beginning of the year. Uh, we have 30 plus large clients on a pipeline, most of them actually multi-billion dollar companies. And we have an ecosystem token sales pipeline where we actually allow people to be validators of our distributed uh, environments and add to the resiliency of the whole ecosystem and validate uh, uh, threats across the networks. So uh, just as kind of like a final point and uh, agreeing with everybody on the panel, uh, which is not always what you want with the panel, but uh, there is a lot left to be done in cybersecurity. And uh, we believe that we're just scratching the surface by doing something different. Um, all right. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Well done. Great, great pitch and great information there. Who would like to go first? Maybe we like when there's comments just on the industry relating to the pitch and then followed by a question if possible. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to jump in it. So well done, it certainly seems unique and interesting approach. Um, 
David, question: How do you start? Yeah, I mean, you're 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 turning security architecture on its head. So, uh, how do you work with your with your clients? You, how do you start small with something like this? Because I feel like it's hard to start small if you have to have every sort of asset on a blockchain to be truly effective. So, do you convince them to go big right out of the gate, or is there a way to start small and have them um, have them expand from there? I'm just trying to understand your ability to get to market. No, I, I got you. Thanks for the question. So. You know, as a CISO, there's two things that uh, kind of like are barrier to enter for a new solution. One of them is like how easy it is to implement and how easy it is to expand. And is it going to change any of the processes that they already have? Uh, and if so, you know, what's the impact? Do I need to install a server somewhere in my data center? Do I need to trust your stuff, even though I don't know anything about you, right? As a vendor, that's important. So uh, for us, we make it kind of like simple for the client, as simple as possible. So, um, this is just, uh, you know, this is the installation is very simple, deployment is very simple. We don't need any hardware appliance anywhere. This is fully software only. Um, from a computation power uh, principle and in terms of like clients changing their own infrastructure, it's not necessary. We work on top only of the infrastructure they have. We don't need anything extra to be there. We don't need any special cloud services or whatever. Their security actually comes from their own networks and their devices that actually create the consensus network between them and add to the res resiliency of the whole platform. So um, yeah. without making a long-winded answer, it's simply about letting the client know that he can start with like 20 devices and grow to thousands if he wants in one day. Deployment is extremely simple. Just, you know, they have a unique um, um, APK package or a unique MSI package or depends on the operating system they are on, Linux, Windows, uh, Mac OS, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it's a one-day deployment. And the uh, proof of value actually comes probably after less than a week where we'll start seeing actually a bunch of like known threats living on those systems. Thank you. Um, awesome. Yeah, so David, uh, this is Eva. I really like, you know, what you have present here. I would love to maybe, you know, dig a little bit deeper in terms of the technology offline. But I have a few questions uh, when, when it comes to implementation. Uh, when, you know, when you're deploying all these kind of, uh, you know, cyber, cyber security notes, um, you know, on a blockchain, are you doing it on a public chain or on a private chain? No, no, we are doing it on, on, on private chains. Right. So now if that's the case, you know, um, for a typical customer, I mean, what are we talking about in terms of number of nodes? You know, do we need to have hundreds of nodes, thousands of nodes or tens of nodes, you know, will be, will be sufficient to actually protect, um, you know, let's say an enterprise. Right. So actually that goes directly towards the way that we do consensus. Um, as you mentioned, um, computational power is, uh, it, you know, it's a constant war against uh, thermodynamics. It doesn't, <laughs> it, right now we are in a position that, for, especially about blockchain or certain blockchains uh, are using proof of work, let's say, um, it, it's, it's, it works well, but it's very inefficient from a perspective of power usage. Um, an impact on the environment. So uh, there's two things to say about that in our case. Uh, we have very, very, very low impact in computational uh, power usage. So I'm not even talking about thousands of cores mining something like, <laughs> you know, even if you're a home miner, you would have, you know, I don't know how many graphics cards you'd be doing. But um, in our case, um, compared, for example, to other cybersecurity tools, say you have an antivirus that is right about 40% to 60% of the time, which is a horrible thing because if you jump, you know, from an airplane and you want to open your parachute, then 40% probability that you'll open, you probably won't jump. But this is what everybody surrendered to, right? So. Um, we have compared to their use, for example, CPU usage uh, in a typical system, which will be between 20 and 40% of CPU usage per core. We have about 1% or half a percent average. Um, and that includes blockchain consensus as well. We use proof of stake principles and other principles as well, aligned with this, not proof of work. Um, so the client can start, for example, with 10 devices, say, for example, and every device that's added increases the, the, the um, reliance or the, the, how can I say, capability of the network by, the, by a power of two, um, as actually all validators are, quote, quote, indistinguishable between them, and they're anonymous, and that's also to prevent internal threats from actually spreading. Um, so I hope that answered the question. It does. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you, uh, you mentioned consensus. It wasn't clear to me what you're taking a consensus of. Uh, so what, what are all of these devices uh, sort of deciding right. amongst themselves? 
so you know I, I guess the answer is like you know why are you using blockchain in that case um you know we pull a lot of metadata about all these systems right um applications processes networks um so we can have the blockchain nodes validate all their keys because they all become cryptographic values and enforce security from then on so we can ensure that uh, you know under distributed consensus that none of them uh, um, are known threats themselves or they have been tampered with so um, from a consensus mechanism model, we use a mix of proof of stake and also um, kind of like uh, we have a, a protocol that uh, selects randomly the nodes that are going to be the next validators. And that has to do with kind of like preventing 51% attacks, especially in small networks that can happen. You know, imagine, you know, just thinking about, you know, side channel attacks, if somebody actually took control of our own network, for example, um, would they be able to easily take over control of the, the client in order to do an attack? Now, this is actually quite a hard thing to do, but it's possible from an academic perspective, and it has happened before. Um, so we thought about that principle, and we actually use a very similar principle that, for example, Algorand uses, in which uh, um, uh, every validator is actually known, not known to the others, um, and you're actually validating everything based on zero zero knowledge and zero proof principles. So you don't know what you're validating, but you still can validate if something is following the right rules and is protected or not. Very interesting, thank you. Awesome, thank well, you. That, that's it. Uh, we'll cut it there just for the sake of time. So we'll wrap up. David, thanks so much for the presentation and also stalling while my computer completely crashed. Um, if I was able to chime in through the, the my phone at that point to listen in. So well done, uh, great pitch as per always. Uh, as we do wrap up, maybe I can launch one last poll for the audience here so we can all have some fun. Uh, what And so I think the panelists can also participate as well. So. What is the biggest enterprise concern? As we, as you guys are all answering that, uh, maybe I'll just flip it back to our panelists. Rapid question time. So just three real quick questions. Uh, what company should we all look at in 2021? What, what is an exciting company, whether it's negative or positive, like a good or bad reason? What should we be looking at in 2021? start. Um, I, I'm actually looking at ICERA. It's a quantum uh, cybersecurity company based in Waterloo. They have raised, you know, a, a good amount of money. Um, I think it's a good company to kind of watch and see how the actual industry in the pre-quantum world welcoming quantum positioned products. So this is certainly a company that I'll be keeping an eye on. Awesome. Dave or Jeremy? I'm going to be shameless in the promotion of one of our portfolio companies. I mentioned it earlier, and that's Cinchi. It's a very interesting data fabric player and it's got all sorts of great implications for application design or business solution design, but also security. I've had a lot of great interactions with a company called Offchain Labs. Uh, some colleagues uh, from Princeton University started the company and it does a scale, it's a scaling solution for Ethereum. So everyone knows Ethereum is too slow at the base layer. And now there's a lot of interest in how you're going to scale it. And they have an optimistic roll-up uh, is the technology that they use. And it's a really nice product. All right, real quick, this is like one kind of word answer, maybe a year. What year does quantum go mainstream? I'm actually going to give it maybe, you know, seven to 10 years. <laughs> I say 30 years. Go with 2035. Put a pin <laughs> in it. <laughs> awesome. And then as I launched this end this poll, what were your key concerns that the enterprises should focus as you guys all saw? Maybe just the one area that the, the, the one area that you think is the most important. I voted insider threats, social engineering. I, I think those are, are important areas that, that don't get the same attention necessarily as, as the technical threats. Jeremy and I are on the same page there. I did the same. Well, for me, I actually, you know, put down uh, ransomware, you know, for enterprise uh, that I'm most concerned I, because I've seen my friends, you know, frantically, you know, worry about these things. So that's how I say. Awesome. And we saw some other COVID and, and, uh, and uh, cloud IoT. So that's it for, for today's session. Really appreciate all the panelists, especially you for, for making time for today and a good YouTube stream on live as well. So you'll be able to see it and share the recordings there afterwards. Really appreciate you guys making time for this very important issue so that we can just create some awareness around what's happening. And uh, that's it for today. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.